Hollywood is being rebuilt by artists not afraid to disrupt the status quo, telling fresh stories and bringing to life characters who until now have been confined to the margins. This is Emerging Hollywood. I am here with executive producer, host, activist, and New York Times bestselling author, Padma Lakshmi. How are you? I'm good. Did I nail the name? You did. You did really mm. well. Thank mm. you. Mm. I've been practicing. I've been practicing. <laughs> now, what, what's the name mean? I'm, I'm big on names. Padma means lotus or water lily. It's a flower that blooms in stagnant water. And Lakshmi is also usually a first name, but not always and is the goddess of prosperity in Hinduism, mm. both in Sanskrit. How do you feel like you've lived up to your name thus far? I think to a large degree, I probably have blossomed in some stagnant water. Definitely, it's a good metaphor. Prosperity, I'm working on it. <laughs> you, you, you look prosperous to me. I'm doing fine. Yes. I'm, yeah, I'm doing fine. Now, you were born in India. You grew up in America. What, what was your childhood like? My childhood was divided between New York City and South India. I grew up an American kid, a latchkey kid. My mom was a single parent. We came here because she had a divorce from my father. It was an arranged marriage, and we were making a new life here as immigrants. Mm. And then all, every summer I got sent to my grandma's house, um, and they were like second parents to me, my grandparents, to give my mom a break, but also to keep with my Indian culture, to still speak Tamil, to be connected to my family. So I'm still very much tied to all that family. And they still live there. My grandma still lives in South India. What was your relationship with your parents growing up? My relationship was really tight with my mom. Um, I did not know my father. I never met my father until I was an adult. Mm. I didn't really even have any pictures of him. So all of my family is just always on my mother's side. I've gotten to know him a little bit as an adult, but. You know, you can't miss what you never had. I was going to ask, did you, did you want that relationship growing up? No, no. I had many people in my mother's family who uh, served as surrogate fathers. I had my grandfather, who I'm incredibly, you know, close to. And I was loved and parented by, you know, a big group of people. Now, what made you appreciate other cultures? How did you feel when people, I guess, didn't appreciate yours, per se? You know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in America, both in New York and in Los Angeles, and it was pretty white. And then you had black culture, and you could understand that, but there weren't enough of me, Indians, oh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in America to really have an opinion. There was Apu on The Simpsons. Oh! That's the only, gotcha, you know, gotcha. that was the only thing that you saw okay. of Indian people in the media. So kids didn't know, or Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. If you're Indian and that, you see that movie, and it broke my heart, because I love Steven Spielberg. I love E.T., I love Color Purple, I love him as a filmmaker. And, but that movie, if you talk to any Indian kid who grew up in America, they will tell you that it was really hard. You know, they're eating monkey brains mm -hmm. and snakes, and fine if people want to do that, but that's so antithetical to most of Indian culture, and then you get teased for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I did get bullied, but because I had to navigate two cultures, you know, because I split my childhood in this way, you know, it made me suffer in the short term, I think, is, you know, you're never Indian enough and you're never American enough here in America, so you always feel like an outsider. But as an adult, I honestly think that was a good training ground mm -hmm. for understanding how different people think. And I think that's a lesson that all of us can benefit from. I think that's really what made me interested in culture because I grew up in an immigrant culture. And you know, it wasn't that I grew up with a lot of Indians. I grew up though with a lot of immigrants from Mexico, from the Philippines, you know, a lot of black kids, you know. That's how I grew up. I had to code switch a little bit. And there was a lot of people code switching again. Mm -hmm. We saw it. We all were different when we walked through the threshold Absolutely. of our immigrant parents. When's the first time you think you, you, you felt seen? as far as like representation in the industry. Be like, oh, that's me. Nobody. Wow. <laughs> Nobody. I mean, now, mm -hmm. now on TV and in film, you have a lot of Indian actors, you know. And there's Cal Penn, there's Sarita Chowdhury, who's a fantastic actor. There's, you know, Mindy Kaling, there's Hasan Minaj, there's, you know, all these wonderful mm -hmm. people. But when I was first on TV, there weren't any of those people. Maybe Sarita, Sarita had certainly done that movie with Denzel. Mm -hmm. There was Dr. Sanjay Gupta on CNN. 
That's who, <laughs> that's who I could point to. I grew up around a lot of cultures in this country and it's what made my childhood really rich and really deep. Um, and I want us as Americans to remember that. Um, and I think that's why cultures interest me too, because they're a great vehicle for teaching people how to reconnect. And I think that in this country, we really need to reconnect. What were the beauty standards you saw growing up? Now it's hum very homogenized, but when I was young, I saw beauty standards that deferred. For instance, I talked about going from my mom's house in New York to going down to South India to my grandma's house. And in the 80s still, it was more desirable to be voluptuous. You looked better in a sari, you filled it out, you know, that, that was the Indian beauty, that kind of curvaceous, typical temple sculpture, right? Mm -hmm. But in America, it was already to be thin, you know, it was already like very statuesque and, you know, Christy Brinkley and thinner. That was the white view. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely yeah, white, yeah, yeah. all white. Other than Beverly Johnson, who I saw when I was really young, I didn't see any um, brown or black girls or women on the covers mm -hmm. of anything, not on TV, not in commercials not in magazines. And I think going from those two cultures, which had different beauty standards, what they all had in common, whether it's India or America, is light skin is better. Mm. Light skin is better. Mm -hmm. It's more desirable, it's more beautiful. Which is BS, by the way. Which is totally BS, yeah. but you I'm internalize that stuff. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm a black of the berry, the sweet of the juice type of guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But how, how did that affect what you viewed as your place in the world? I honestly, like, I didn't know that I would ever be able to be, to be allowed into the circle. You know, I think I'm old enough to see that things are getting better and they have changed since I was in my 20s and 30s. But, you know, I think it's a lot better in Hollywood now than 20 years ago. But it was hard. You know, a lot of times they would say, oh, you know, we, we really liked her, but we're not going ethnic with this role. Or, you know, it's, <laughs> wow. yeah, they sure they do, yeah. yeah. But I mean, look at, like, even when I started on television in America, like, it was mostly white male chefs. Like, we had to work hard on Top Chef to make it better. And we have, mm -hmm. I think. We've done a good job of it. You know, I think we can even do better, actually. In many rooms, very early in my career, I was always the, the darkest person there. Or maybe there was one African-American there, but that's about it, you know? Mm -hmm. There were never more than one or two of us. And I think, you know, that always, it's like, it, it's always there in the background. And mm -hmm. you, just, you just have to ignore it because you have to hope that there'll be other things about you that will compensate. For many young Indian girls and women in America, I think I'm the first Indian woman or Asian they've seen, you know, and I, it's nice because I'm playing myself on Top Chef. I'm not acting in that and I don't, you know, play a role. My role is not dependent on my ethnicity or the color of my skin. It's just what I bring to, the, to that role. Is that a lot of pressure, knowing that you're that representation? No, it's not pressure because mm -hmm. I always want to do my best anyway. I'd like to be a role model for my daughter mm -hmm. and for other young girls like her, but I also have to be myself. And that's a flawed person who will also make mistakes sometimes or whatever. But on average, I would like there to be more people like me on TV so that um, we see different points of view. You know, that's what Taste the Nation is all about. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing that. And I got turned down by like seven networks before one let me do Taste the Nation. And I'm glad I wound up where I was, where I am, mm -hmm. because I think they're a great support to me. But, you know, we only saw one food story in America. And that, I knew, was not the only story because I had traveled the country for so many years with Top Chef and before. I knew that there was all this interesting food. And behind that food, there was really a bunch of interesting people, you know? Um, that's what the Gullah Geechee episode is all about. That's right. Um, in Charleston. That's right, 843. And, that's um, home. And also, you know, there were these Native uh, American stories that were really cool and these Thai stories. And so, like, I'm just lucky now to be doing what I love, independent of what my skin color is and mm -hmm. what I look like. You know, I'm, I started out as a model and then I, you know, was acting and I'm happy to be free of the shackles of having to fit someone else's visual representation of what 
uh, the job requires. The job requires me because I'm good at my job. You admitted when you started that you had imposter syndrome. So how did you overcome it? I still have imposter syndrome. I know. Don't you, you go do. in and out, I right? Do. You yeah. know what? It depends on the day, honestly. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest. Like I have opportunities coming to me now that I would have killed for 10 years ago. And it's so late in coming that I'm sometimes like, don't believe I should even have it sometimes. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. And, you know, I was like, in my head, I'm like, where were you 10 years ago? Because right. I was the same person. I was certainly the same talent. And everything just takes longer. Um, but, you know, I still uh, sometimes I walk around my house and I'm like, who the fuck lives here? You know, <laughs> like I, I'm still in my head. I'm still that young woman who's striving, who's, you know, wants to make sure she will always be able to be financially independent and take care of her folks and, you know, um, just make her way in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no guarantee and no path for me to look to as example about whether there was a path. You know, a path appeared for me along the way and I navigated that path. Um, and I'm lucky, and I worked hard. Mm -hmm. So now I just have to make sure I reap those benefits well. That imposter syndrome is a motherfucker. It, it really is, yeah, it, it, and, it, it, and it strikes you down like at the most terrible moments, you know? And I think when you have imposter syndrome, not only do you doubt yourself and second guess yourself, you also think that you shouldn't be, not that hungry, but that consuming, mm. you know, you, you are, I was as an Asian immigrant woman in this country told to take up as little space as I could. Mm. And so when you actually have the room to spread your wings, you almost have to teach yourself how to do it, mm. you know, a little bit, mm. I think. I wonder if we could deal with imposter syndrome better if we didn't hear the opinions of so many other people, like through social media and everything. Like, oh, for sure, yeah. for sure. But can I tell you something? There is a lot that also has come that's been positive to me from social media. It's been wonderful because I have been able to connect with all those brown folk all over the country mm -hmm. who do DM me. I don't read all the DMs, but when they um, comment on a cooking video or on something I've posted, I read those comments. And it, those have also buoyed me up. You've opened up about being the kid in school who was teased about her lunch. How does it feel to go from that to now being a culinary expert who introduces all this amazing <laughs> new food to households everywhere? I think that's why I do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's why. It's that little girl trying to explain that her food isn't that funky. You know, I'm just yeah. doing the adult version of it now. You know, I've been very lucky to do what I'm naturally interested in in regards to food. And, you know, I started my career in food when I was almost 30. You know, mm -hmm. I, I had another career before then. So I, I think it's that. I think the little girl who wants to say, it's really yummy. I know it looks a little gross, but it's really yummy and you'll like it and it's good for you. I'm just doing that on an international scale and getting paid for it. I've been translating the two cultures. I do that through food. I enjoy it and I love to eat. I think food is a sensual, beautiful need and pleasure that humans have. And the world is a delicious place. And I want to share that passion through teaching people about other cultures. If you would have walked up to Lil, Lil Patma, she was being teased about her lunch and said, hey, one day you're going to be one of the world's biggest culinary experts. Would she believe you? I don't think so. I don't mm. think so. I knew that I was going to be sparkly in some way, mm -hmm. you know, as mm -hmm. a little girl would say it maybe. I, I had that suspicion about myself that I did have some little pixie dust uh, in me, but I did never, I never knew what that was, or I didn't, I certainly didn't know it was going to be in food. That wasn't a career. You've been a model, you know, you're, you're a host, you're an author. Which one do you think gave you the most confidence? Being a writer. It's very therapeutic. Because it's all me. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I waited a long time for people to cast me in things and uh, hire me in things. And writing, no one has to hire you. If you're good, uh, you work. There was a long time where um, I was making a living also as an actor, as a model, and as a writer. And um, 
the writing is good because it, you can go anywhere, and it's just you and your intellect and your imagination. Mm -hmm. Did it help put your life in perspective for you too? Because then you yes, realized it did. your life, it everything did. was a chapter. It did, yeah. it did. You know, writing the memoir was very, actually, it's very cathartic, it's very therapeutic because you see patterns in your life just, you know, sheer, by the sheer force of having to document them that you may not have seen before. And I think that is an exercise that everybody should, should try. I feel great sense of pride. That is what takes away the imposter syndrome when I write something well and I know it's good mm. for me. Mm. That gives me focus. Now, you, you talked about, you know, being a representation for a lot of young women. You're a prominent South Asian woman. You know, a lot of them see themselves in you. What does that mean to you? I'm glad they have me to see. Mm -hmm. I'd have loved to have a me to see. And I hope they have more of us, you know. I don't think you need to see just people who look like you. Like, I think I really admired Oprah. I really you know, admired uh, different women, Gloria Steinem. I really admired, you know, a lot of women that I saw in the media who I knew were smart, who were accomplished, who were making their mark in the world. And they did, none of them looked like me. Mm -hmm. So I still got the benefit of that um, example. But it would have been so much nicer to also have somebody who looked a little bit like me. Mm -hmm. And I think I want that for all the girls. It means the world to me because then that means hopefully their path will be easier than mine was. I mentor two or three young women in their 20s mm -hmm. and it's the most gratifying work I do. And I wish I had had that so that I could do this instead of this, <laughs> you know. Or, but that's okay, I had to do that, I did that. I did what I needed to do. What, what is your parenting style? I'm definitely, um, I would say, probably a little more explicit with my daughter than um, some parents might be. I believe in communicating with her. You know, I'm lucky she's uh, a very emotionally intelligent little girl, but I would rather her know the truth um, and be a little scared than be misinformed or, uh, or incompletely informed and not prepared for a situation. I want to tell her the truth about everything, so I'm very, very frank with her. I have a lovely relationship with her. She's mm -hmm. the best thing that ever happened to me. I didn't think I was going to be able to have a daughter or, any, or a son. I just didn't, I was told I couldn't have children. So mm -hmm. the fact that she exists in it of itself is just a gift. She's from a miracle God. in a lot of ways. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think it, I don't think you have to have children to be complete. But in my case, I do think that it opened me up. In a, in a much uh, deeper emotional way um, that was very positive on my life. What did you learn late that, you, that you've taught her early? I've taught her how to protect herself. Mm -hmm. When I sent her even to pre-K in language that is appropriate for her, I just told her if you know, anyone touches you or uh, makes you touch them and you don't feel okay about it, mommy will never get mad at you. You just run, you, know, you say no, you run, you go and you tell someone you trust, I don't care if it's somebody mommy knows, somebody daddy knows, somebody at school. And you know, that's really early. We're talking, having mm -hmm. that conversation at four. Mm -hmm. I did it because I wanted her to be prepared and have the language to protect herself. Kids need to know that they still have authority and dominion over their own bodies. Absolutely. And so I wanted to make sure to empower her and, and that she knew. What about when it comes to like uh, mental and, um, and emotional health? Do you talk to her about those things? Yeah, mm -hmm. I talk to her about those things a lot. I mean, you know, she's seen mommy be really sad. I always tell her that, you know, it's okay to talk. It's also okay to say that you're not able to talk right now, but that you know that you need to talk and things like that. Just to give her the language to say, it's all right. Like sometimes people feel sad and it's okay to accept that sadness but you should deal with it. What's your most helpful form of self-care? Just being still. I love just being in my pajamas, reading the newspaper, and staying in a quiet house all day and reading. That is my self-care. That's personal time. Now, you're an advocate and ambassador for many important causes. When did you realize like, your voice could be a tool for, for positive change? When I found out I couldn't have children mm. and I started a foundation with my uh, surgeon 
for women's reproductive disorder called endometriosis. I'm so I, glad you pronounced that, not endometriosis. <laughs> I was looking at well, it like, should I try it? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it happens to everybody. You're not even a doctor. There are a lot of doctors who can't pronounce it still. Absolutely. So we started this foundation and we've been able to do a lot in a decade. And, you know, it's an icky thing. Like, nobody wants to talk about their period. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's a disease of the womb and that's where we all come from. And so I'm really proud of the work we've done there. And, you know, I think that... The, that experience of speaking out about that issue, which is so personal, it laid the ground for me. It was a great training ground for me to then later work with the ACLU and the United Nations. I would never be able to do all that I've done with ACLU on immigrant rights if it wasn't for what I um, got the experience of and learned just with the you know medical foundation and so it was that experience that made me really understand that oh okay you know I can use my public persona to just like throw attention to this yeah I think the best thing about that is just being able to dispense that information mm -hmm. you know what I mean because it happens to so many women they just don't know what yeah. what, like, what's behind it you know yeah yeah that's one of the things like we educated like 35,000 at last count kids in the New York area and I went on a ride along and one of the best things was this 15 year old kid came up to me and he said, what would you do if you thought somebody had it? And I said, oh, I said, I would get them a specialist. I would look online and you can go to our website. And he said, I think, he said, after hearing you talk, I think my mom has it wow. and I want to help her because I always see her suffering. And that is a win. That's a great win Absolutely. for me because, you know, that boy is going to grow up to be hopefully a great partner, a great father, a great colleague. So that work became really gratifying to me. Um, and then after the election with Trump, I had to do something because people were talking such shit about immigrants. And I knew that wasn't my experience. I knew that's what that's not what it was like to grow up in an immigrant neighborhood. So I started working with the ACLU. And then after five years of doing that, I thought, I want to do something in my professional life that marries what I do outside of work in my advocacy. Um, and that's how Taste of Nation came about. In, in, in regards to immigration rights, like what do you think is needed? And, and what do you think more people should know? I think the immigration system needs a little bit of an overhaul. I think, you know, I'm by no means a policy expert, but I do think we need to look at the way in which we treat refugees and migrant workers and that process clearly needs to be updated and it needs to be standardized at the southern border. I think we do need reform, but I think we need to look at it within the context of the history of our country Absolutely. and the history of this nation, because unlike any other place in the world, this is the country it is because it was built by waves upon waves of different immigrants. You need policy that is forward thinking and pragmatic, but that also recognizes the history um, of what immigration has meant to the evolution and existence of this country. And those two things have to meet. Absolutely. Now you work on a bunch of projects, a lot of products. What's the one that gets you the most excited when you get up in the morning? Taste the Nation. Mm. Taste the Nation and the children's book also. Okay. So my writing really, which, you know, Taste the Nation is also an offshoot of my writing. It feels really good to have the privilege of creating a show from the ground up. That's nothing I've had before, Taste the Nation, and it feels really great to do that. You know, when I'm filming Taste the Nation, I'm, if I have to be up at five, I naturally wake up at 4.30 because I'm excited at what the day is gonna bring, and it's, it's really thrilling to me. And it feels really great to write a children's book because what I feel like my mission is becoming is to really educate everybody about food and how that affects us, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and mentally. Like, I think a lot of mental health um, centers around food as well. Absolutely. You know, the preparation of it, the, the communing with someone else over it, the comfort that it gives you. It plays a really big role in, in so much of our lives. And I think teaching kids about food, I would like to do more of that. If you could go back, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Everything takes longer than you think it's going to. Mm. Everything takes longer. And you just have to be really patient, patient with yourself and to relax. <laughs> I would say relax mm -hmm. a little bit. If, if you could go forward, what would you say to your 70-year-old self? I hope you had enough fun along the way. 
A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, a lot of good fun. Yeah. I think that's what we're missing a little bit. They don't tell you that when you finally get the success you dream about, you don't have time to enjoy it sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I hope that whatever my projects uh, are, that I really enjoy the shit out of them. Like just all suck right. all the juice and learn and grow. That's what I hope for myself. Well, Padma, I've enjoyed the shit out of this time. <laughs> Thank I you. hope you have too. I have too.